Hello, and welcome to today's seminar. I'm Beth Maszewski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and seminar co-organizer. A few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd like to remind our audience members to please silence electronic devices as we are recording today's seminar. We will hold all questions until the end, at which time I will bring around the microphone so that those online can hear your questions. For those online, you can type in your questions at any time in the GoToWebinar chat box, and we'll answer those at the end as well. And so with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Paul Edmondson. Paul is the Theron and Dorothy Peterson Professor of Chemistry and Analytical Chemist at, at the College of Worcester in Ohio. He earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Pepperdine University and his PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Arizona. His research interests include advanced materials for chemical separations as applied to environmental engineering. And his professional achievements include numerous awards from the National Science Foundation, including an NSF career award for research in detection of explosives via molecularly engineered organosilica materials. He is also a member of the American Chemical Society and co-chair of the ACS Division of Analytical Chemistry Graduate Fellowship Committee. He has over, order, over 40 publications and 40 patents based on his organosilica research. Please join me in welcoming Paul. Yep, I'm on. So thank, yep, thank you, Beth, and thanks to the Institute for inviting me here today. Um, it's great to be here, seeing Lance and everyone. And um, I thought I'd start off with uh, talking about the College of Worcester, because maybe that's something that you don't know about. Uh, that's where I'm from, uh, where I'm a chemistry professor. The College of Worcester is just south of Cleveland. It's a liberal arts college, private school, that has about 2,000 students. It's in the Ohio Five, which is Oberlin, Ohio Wesleyan, Denison, Kenyon, and Worcester. Um, this is what you're looking at here in this slide is the chemistry building is right here and behind it is our brand new 41 million dollar life science building that's connected to it. So we have a fairly robust uh, science program at Worcester. About half of all students take general chemistry at the college and um, we're noted for a few things that's different. We're, we're definitely unique in higher ed. One, one thing is that uh, every student at the College of Worcester, it's only undergraduate, has to do a research project to graduate. So that includes defending it in front of a faculty committee, uh, writing a, at least about 60 page thesis, and doing a presentation. So it's sort of like a mini graduate program at the uh, undergraduate level. The other school that does it the same way we do is Princeton. So, at, so a lot of our resources are and our curriculum is based on this three semester uh, capstone experience in doing research. In fact, in this photograph, which was taken last spring, you see a, one of our young students uh, going to give a poster session because they're required to do a poster session in the spring. Um, we're also known as the Fighting Scots. So we have a, our, uh, we have a marching band, and that's the marching band. They wear kilts. And what they're doing, this is, this, is a, this is a tradition that's going to be happening in a couple weeks at Worcester. The bagpipes are leading the senior class. All their theses are due in two weeks. So that when they turn it in, there's a big celebration, a parade across campus marking the fact that they completed their undergraduate research. So it's a, it's a celebrated tradition that goes back to the mid-1940s. So if you're interested in the College of Worcester, come by and check me out. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about today are a set of emerging contaminants called perfluoroalkyl substances, or PFOS for short. Um, the major PFOS compounds, PFOS and PFOA, are up here. Um, I'm not going to go into a big background about this. I think if, if, if you're watching or here or online, you're going to know that this is a, uh, an area of concern. They're from a variety of products, including uh, aqueous film forming foams that are used to put out fires. So there, there's localized contamination at airfields and other places where firefighting activities have gone on. And it's becoming uh, detectable in, in numerous places across the country in groundwater. So my, my focus on this is not fate and transport, but on developing new types of absorbent media to remove those from water. 
So just a quick primer as we move forward into this. Uh, there's a wide diversity of chemistries in these PFOS compounds. Although P, PFOS and PFOA, the C8 carbon chain PFOS substances, are the most common and the ones that have regulatory guidance around them. There are numerous other um, molecules that have been co-produced, co-manufactured that are also of, of, of emerging concern. So the things that are going to be important to note during today's talk is two things. Number one is the length of the, the fluoroalkyl group. So both perfluoro, the O stands for octane, so octal, so this is C8, C8, is shorter chain compounds like PFBA, it's a butanoic acid, and all the ones in between. So those, there's chain length diversity, and there's also polar group diversity. So some PFOS compounds are not charged. So PFOSA is one. And some are actually positively charged. They're rare, and they're not uh, as, many, as much a concern. But you can have a diversity here. So when you're developing different absorbents, it's important to think about not only just the two major um, regulatory guided ones, but also the ones that may also be coexisting in water and trying to treat them. So, so that's the big goal. So you have a diversity of PFOS compounds in a water system and coming up with a absorbent technology to help remediate the water. That's what we're going to talk about today. So um, here's the trouble. Um, these fluoroalkyl groups have only limited uh, interactions, intermolecular interactions. Now, it's a lot to unpack there because they do make interactions, but they're very, they're very distinct, and they like to stick to each other. They, they're certainly uh, typically not really these molecules that often you see in intermolecular forces. We see that because we'll make things out of fluoroalkyl groups like Teflon and surface coatings, which are not really surface active. So we're trying to bind a non-surface active compound. Second of all, these chain lengths and polar groups vary. So if you're going to create, if you're going to use that part of the molecule to absorb, well, then the, if you try to think of ion exchange, well, you might get one but not the other. Also, some things that are really preferred here. One, if they could do reversible absorption, that would be great because then you could recover the compounds and reuse the absorbent. The, the PFOS compounds are not biodegraded, at least we don't know of them there yet. So they're very recalcitrant, so you need some way to, to dispose of it. So if you could remove it and then just and to, and to eliminate it through like incineration, that would be great. And then selectivity is going to be something that's, that's going to be preferred, especially if there's lots of other organics in the water. So those are the challenges. How do we get there? All right, I'm going to side take us on a side, a side channel here of learning before we come back to PFOS so I can let you understand the types of materials that I'm working with so you understand how this is going to operationally work with my research. So the absorbents I make are created from monomers up. So we build them from, from, from single monomers, polymerize them together to create porous materials. That, the method that we use is a well-known method called the Soldel method, where you take si silanes that have alkoxy groups and hydrolyze them and condense them to form a three-dimensional siloxane matrix. So what we, what we have here is a lot of control over the process. We have control over the precursors that we use. We have control over the speed at which they're made. We have control over their three-dimensional three shape uh, and their final state. So it's, it's a really nice process if you're trying to, do, to stu fundamentally study absorption that you can create the absorbent from scratch using a set of precursors and making a process. Now, the way this works is that you start with these precursors and they start to polymerize then they all form a network, and that's the gel part, from sole solution to a gel. And then the gel can be further processed. It can be evaporated to form a collapsed network that's porous. It could be 
uh, solvent extracted to form an aerogel, so a very expanded network, or you can create films or dense ceramics. So there's a lot of variety here. Now the place that I'm going to stop at here is zero gels is what we work with. However, we'll see that um, the absorbents I work with reversibly go transform between a zero gel and aerogel. Finally, uh, one important part is that to create more porosity and more functionality, our silanes have a bridging organic group to kind of spread out the matrix and allow a more porosity in the final material. All right, so this is the, this is the primary precursor which I use to generate absorbents. So it's a bridge precursor. So it has an a, a aryl group here. This allows for structural um, intermolecular forces to build up a chyloidal particles. So each one of these little dots here and here is probably a collection of about 200 of these individual silanes that are polymerized. Then these individual chyloidal parts assemble into a larger part and the generating pores at which is the pores of the absorbent. So it's not, it's, so it's a, it's a very unique material that it's not like a, a regular organic polymer that's like linear groups that are created and then cross-linked. Now these are like chyloidal particles that form the gel. This would be like solvent in it to create this porous architecture. Now this, this, this bridging group is really important to generate a specific type of porous architecture that one thing is that's really unique in that it swells. So this is a photograph of the granular sole gel derived absorbent in the zero gel state. So it looks like grain, grains of white powder, right? Which is very what porous powder. And this would be the electron micrograph of that material. So you have these clusters and connected together. However, if you uh, take this, the granular material and apply a liquid organic solvent to it, regardless of what it is, methanol, hexane, it will instantaneously and spontaneously swell to expand back up. So it's going from that zero gel collapse network back to an aerogel like pore liquid filled pore network. So that's what's going on here. So when you look at the micro scale architecture of the absorbent, it can then go through this expanded state to maybe an even more expanded state. The other thing I want to note here is that the material is very hydrophobic. So if you expose the granular material to water, it will not swell. It will not absorb water. It will not even absorb water vapor to our, to our measurements. So it's going to exclude water completely in the dry state. So this, was, this, this is definitely interesting. Um, by the way, just some, uh, some data here. So the, the surface area of the dry porous material is about 550 meters squared per gram. It has an internal pore volume of 0.71. When you, when you swell it, the volume change of an individual grain is about 2 to 3x, although um, co-workers of mine have actually made particles that swell 35x, and it's pretty amazing to see a particle swell that much. But, not, but normally we don't work with that because they're pretty, they're pretty fragile. And the volume absorbed is about 5 milliliters per gram, so it swells here. So our best interpretation of what's going on is that, the, again, this is a zero gerd aerogel conversion, expansion of the pore network. We can see this in the, the electron micrograph, which we created by uh, swelling it with a polymer solution and evaporating the, the, the solvent. And this is the pores collapsed back down on the, on the, um, onto the polymer. The fully swollen state is still an enigma to us. We really don't really understand it completely. This is one electron micrograph image that we obtained through supercritical drying the material, but I don't know if that's characteristic of it or not. It's very difficult to study the 
surface area and pore volume on it because if you evaporate it, 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 it collapses back down to the dry state. So the expanding and contracting is completely reversible. So if you, if you dry it, it just goes back to where he started and so you can't study it anymore. So, so it's, it's very, very difficult to study. We've done numerous experiments, but right now it's still kind of a question mark in our head and something that we're still investigating what's going on in the expanded state. Just for full disclosure. And just a few more pictures. So we have a, a, a kind of a picture in our minds about how the sorbent's working. Here's again an electron micrograph of the dry state. And here's the swollen state. Again, I'm not sure if this is 100% true because it isn't filled with liquid. This is, again, supercritically dried, kind of heated to try to preserve this, a potential swollen state. But it, I guess, like, like a turn, intuitively, it makes sense that this granular material is kind of swollen open to have macro pores. Okay, that makes sense. And this is actually what the particle would look like under the microscope. Like the entire particle expands, even, even blemishes and, dis, and uniformities on the surface expand. The entire thing expands and contracts like a sponge. Really neat uh, material to work with. And just to give a little bit more uh, understanding about the material before we go into PFOS absorption. When it expands, uh, it does so sp spontaneously. So if you put liquid on it, it will expand. And when it does that, it, is, uh, it generates mechanical force. So this is not, uh, uh, this is different than maybe like a hydrogel or um, uh, water absorbing polymer in that it generates a lot of a lot of force. Initially, when you, if you expose it to liquid acetone, it can generate 600 newtons per gram of force. So that'd be like a gram for being able to lift about 10,000 grams. So it's quite a bit of force. And that as it expands out, it goes down to zero. So it's kind of like a spring-loaded system. So it's I think that it's actually stored mechanical energy, not chemical energy, or stored potentially like disorder, order to disorder. So when it swells, it actually cools. It's colder, so it's endothermic process. So it seems like it's entropically driven, mechanical expansion. And then when it, when it evaporates, capillary forces of the, of the liquid in the pores reconstrict it back down to a collapsed state, and then you can go through the process again. Uh, the the um, the swell the the force generation doesn't matter if it's coming as a liquid or other other phase. So if you absorb hydrocarbon vapors, so if you absorb propane, it will also slightly expand and generate force. Uh, methane will slightly expand and generate force. So absorption leads to mechanical pore expansion, and that expansion is under seems to be mechanical tension to deliver it. So why wouldn't it? just expand and stay expanded. I think that when it collapses down, you have so much surface area, that collapsed surface area, the intermolecular forces of the pores, there's enough intermolecular forces that prevents the springs from, the mouse trap from being sprung. And it's only when those, those surface interactions are displaced by solvent or other absorbents that you spring load, you spring open the, the pores. So our working model with this are spring-loaded pores that can, be, that can be filled and therefore, and then as you absorb things, you can get more pore space to further absorb more absorbates, which is really different than other absorbents because usually there's a, there's a maximum pore volume and a maximum amount of, of uh, or absorptivity. Um, and the material will absorb vapors. Uh, it's not the fastest absorption. I'm not sure why, but it's, it's uh, slower like an activated carbon. Linear isotherms never plateaus in terms of like partial pressure of acetone vapor. Just keeps going, again, because you're expanding the pores. You do saturate a set, at a set partial pressure, and the amount that you um, 
you, you uh, absorb is dependent on the partial pressure and pretty much as more more absorb more gas phase molecules are there the more it absorbs but this is an interesting experiment I have to describe so if this is a, a acetone absorption with time and if you take a uh, a, uh, the material, which I'll say for right now, we call ozorb. This is the commercial name for it, ozorb, this swellable organosilica. And you expose it to acetone vapor, it will absorb about, about 0.9 grams per gram of acetone vapor. Okay. All right, that's good. So here's what I did. So then what I did is uh, I exposed it to phenol vapor. And it also absorbed about 0.9 grams of phenol vapor under saturated conditions. Then I exposed, so now to absorb the phenol, I said, will it absorb acetone? Well, of course not. It's full of phenol, right? Well, it's actually the opposite. It absorbed a lot more acetone vapor once it was filled with phenol. Again, that's paradoxical than a regular absorbent. Usually when you fill up the pore with, with, a, with an absorbate, you're done. In this case, because the pores can expand, it actually absorbed like four, time, four to five times more acetone. The final absorbed mass was about 4.8 milliliters per gram of absorbate. So that's almost like full pore expansion. So, so why did it do this? Well, I think there's lots of reasons. One is this Routes law that if you if you have a co uh, um, a co absorbate, like it lowers the partial vapor pressure, so you can absorb more. Also, I think there's a strong interaction between acetone and phenol. So here, what we're doing is we're using absorbates to help absorb new absorbates. And that's different than thinking. Normally think, okay, I have a surface, and things absorb to the surface, and I'm done. No, this case, we can fill things, that's the pores with things to help absorb. This is really, this really opens up the possibilities of absorption and, and to another dimension of thinking. Uh, and a final experiment to, to uh, describe how this material works is that it, instead of being granular, it can be cast into a variety of shapes and sizes. Since it's formed from the, like a polymer, you can make pieces of stuff, not just grains, but you can make like this. So this is a disc of, of the, the swell of organic silica ozorb. And you can actually, it actually acts like a membrane. It's continuously porous, so it was placed between um, a, a flow of a gas stream here, then there was a disc, and then another gas stream here. This was propane and water, and this was nitrogen gas. So as the propane and water is flowed here, the propane, being uh, hydrophobic, can enter the pores. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at what's coming through the other side of the disc window on the other side. So this would go to a gas cell and an IR spectrometer. So over time, propane starts flowing through the disk, and so you can start seeing propane going through the solid material. The window of, of um, organosilica is about a millimeter and a half thick. And coming out the other side, water vapor completely excluded. So it's separating the two. Propane can go through. The water cannot. It's an interesting experiment, pretty much like not too um, related to PFOS absorption. However, I wanted you to have the, the mental picture that these pores are interconnected and that a molecule can w absorb through and walk its way through the entire piece of material, even if it's very large. So you have this interconnected pore network. So um, one thing we'll see when, when, we, when we make materials is that we'll, we can put other things inside of the pores. So for instance, um, a polymer or a small molecule could be put into the pores by taking a solution of the small molecule or the polymer, swelling it up, and then evaporating it down. Now, it could just stop right here if this is non-volatile, or if it's completely volatile, everything will come out. But you can actually lead to uh, like 
composite materials that have like polymers or small molecules or, or catalysts or metal particles encapsulated inside of the pores fairly easily. And that's, that's, that's actually um, a kind of an interesting thing for us to work with because we can, we can then make these different types of composite materials. And I have numerous examples. But um, one thing that might be of interest that I've talked about this morning is that when it's in this expanded state, and you can rinse this with water to try to get, like say, a swell with methanol and then replace it with water, it's not the happiest particle in the world, but it will happen. Um, this can also absorb proteins, and it can absorb them spontaneously and irreversibly up to 700 milligrams per gram. So it can make protein composites, polymer composites, metal composites, metal salt composites. And just to give one final example of that before I move back to PFAS, this is just a simp an example of how you can create a, a composite absorbent. So this is um, your swelled organosilica ozorb swollen with a uh, ethanolic solution of copper chloride. So the ethanol is then evaporated, and so now you have a, a porous particle collapsed back down on top of finely distributed copper chloride. Copper chloride really likes to absorb ammonia. So this is uh, ammonia gas coming from this direction onto the absorbent. This is a vial of ammonia gas in the presence of this. It's a maybe not very useful material, but it's definitely an example of what, it's just a sort of example. But although it has a very high binding capacity because it has a quite a bit of copper embedded. And so this is a breakthrough curve for that material. So it just, it's, 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 uh, it has obviously ammonia and copper are a long ways away from PFOS, but I want to share with you the example of taking uh, a material that it's in its of itself is an absorbent and putting something inside the particles that can make a high affinity interaction with the a target molecule in this case ammonia which is making a, a base of uh, a um, Lewis acid base coordinate covalent bond with the copper ion all right so back to back to PFOS so Backing up, review can make materials uh, with specific surface chemistry based on the sol gel chemistry by incorporating silanes. We start with the, uh, a predominance of, use of this molecule, which makes the, the matrix and the morphology we want. But then we can decorate the surfaces with different uh, functional groups. So, a fluorinated version, which I'll call F ozorb, is adding a 15% mole, mole ratio of a fluorinated group. So these would then be copolymerized within the matrix. So now you have a fluorinated pore architecture. You then also could do the same thing where you have a quaternary amine group that could make a ionic interaction with a PFOS compound. It could also be copolymerized. You could take these three and copolymerize them in different amounts, right? So that's what we're doing in this project. I don't, I don't have time to go through all the different per permeations, but these are the things we're doing. The final one is uh, taking a polymer. Remember the idea of putting something inside that will interact. So we'll take a polymer. So this is a uh, a polymer from the personal care industry, used in uh, like as a, a condition, hair conditioner. And it, it ha has a quaternary amine group and it has an amide group. And amide groups have been thermodynamic, have been like uh, using uh, computational models to form a, a, a bond with uh, a hydro, uh, kind of a strange bond with fluorine groups, carb CF groups. So it has a couple different motifs that will be helpful with, uh, with uh, PFOS binding. So we'll call those ozorb, that's black. F, F ozorb, which is the fluorinated one, is blue. Green is the quaternary amine, and orange is the poly QA. So we're going to use that color, color scheme moving forward. So fun. OK, so first thing we did is absorption kinetics to see how fast these molecules could be absorbed. 
Our baseline comparison is with granulated activated carbon. This is the this is like a high grade water treatment carbon. So this is this is absorption of PFOA. Here's the absorption of, of granulated carbon, and then to the ozorb. So it's faster. Why is it faster? Well, here to improve the speed, we found that if you pre-swell it, it opens up the pores and you get really fast absorption. So it's just a pore size opening. And if you fill it with um, with polymer, then that's and don't pre-swell it, just kind of shrink it down on top of the polymer. You get good absorption, and it's about the same as carbon. So we're, so we're about the same as carbon, and if we span the pores open, not surprisingly, you can get better absorption, faster absorption. Okay, here's a lot of data on the, uh, on the, the percent removal. So let me tell you first the experiment. These are the endpoints of the kinetics experiment. So after 18 hours, what percentage of that compound was removed from water? And the starting condition was 2,000 parts per billion, 200 milligrams per liter of dosage, and then the end point was 18 hour contact time. The other variable was the identity of the PFOS compound itself. So over here are the different ones. Now it's sort of alphabet soup when it comes to these compounds. But basically it's perfluoro, and then the other, this letter D stands for deca, nona, octa, hepta, hexa, ethyl, butyl, right? So C10, C9, C8, C7, C7, C6, C5, C4. All carboxylates, so A for acid, carboxylic acid. And then you move down to the second set here. So PFOS, perfluorooctyl sulfonate. So that's a sulfonate, C8, C6, C4. This is the positively charged group, and this is the neutral group. Ozorb, no decoration change, just out, just hydrophobic. Um, pretty good for the for the long chain. Nothing if it gets short chain. Um, with uh, the fluorinated one, eh, actually, not much difference, honestly, here. At least for it in DI water, not much difference. Uh, as you get to short chain, really little absorption. Kind of makes sense. You don't, your only interaction is maybe this weird hydrophobic effect. Not very good. But for, the, for, the, for like a neutral one, great. Neutrals are great. Uh, carbon also has some of the same trends as when it gets to the smaller ones, it, set, it starts to lose effectiveness. But kind of the winner here was the one that was hydrophobic, anion exchanged with the boost of the amide interaction. So the tri, the tri like functionalized material was really good for all of, of them. And even the positively charged one as well. Not as good as the others, but still was getting the positively charged one. All right, so that's in their DI water. Groundwater and other things on up and some other solutions are not DI water. So we upped the concentration of the ionic strength to 50 millimolar NaCl. Now that's more than groundwater, which is usually about maybe five millimolar NaCl. And it's definitely less than like our retentate water, which could also be another treatment stream. But it's sort of, it's in a it's in a it's a big jump it's in that region. Um, adding salt to the water has a big effect, actually. Um, you get better absorption with the hydrophobic ozorb and the fluorinated ozorb, even better to a certain extent with carbon, except for PFBA. It went down. So that makes it seem like PFBA is really being absorbed to carbon by a potential ionic interaction. So maybe there's some positively charged sites in carbon, which are acting as the sink, the sites for those for PFBA, the fork, fork chain, perfluoro chain carbon to be absorbed because that went down. Also, it impacted the impact here with the poly QA with quaternionine polymer also went down. But it definitely en uh, enhanced some of the binding of the longer chain species to the hydrophobic ones. So that's, that's, that's the end point after an 18-hour uh, um, equilibration 
at this dosage. The, the other big question is, as like what people want to know is like, what's the capacity? So if you reach a capacity at like a uh, with absorption isotherm, you know what is what is the comparative capacity what, to the different materials? So this is absorption capacity as measured with absorption isotherms. I'm not going to go through them all. I just want to give like a capacity at a benchmark concentration is when you reach an equilibrium value in a solution of 200 parts per billion. So when you keep adding enough of the of the compound and you reach 200 parts per billion, this is how much absorption is has taken place. So these are the four different ones. And you can kind of see some of the trends. Um, with the with ozorb, which is hydrophobic, as you go to shorter chains, you get less absorption. We kind of saw that before. Um, GAC kind of fluctuates. It's pretty good across the whole suite, actually, except for strangely PFHXS. Don't know why. This is in DI water. Um, and the F, the fluorinate ozorb actually is not too good for the long chains. Not sure why. Kind of takes a maximum and drops away as the, as the chains get shorter. The, 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 the material that has the highest capacity is reminiscent of that. Uh, is, is the polymer infused particle reminiscent of the, the experiment I did with the phenol then following with acetone absorption. So I have something there and, I, I, and then I absorb it. And this has really great capacity, especially for mid-chain uh, PFAS compounds and also still pretty good for um, um, the, the, the sulfonates as well. All right, take that in for a second. We're going to change the experiment by changing one variable by adding salt. All right, we add salt and things change a lot. So this is with 50 molar NaCl. This is the capacity. The scale went up a lot. So I just couldn't put it on. So 25. So there's 25 right here. The impact on the, there was some impact on the quaternary mean especially for the short chain. Here's the weird one. Um, with per, perfluorooctanoic sulfonate, PFOS, the hydrophobic one, and especially the fluorinated one, absorb incredible and large amounts of, of, the, of the, that compound. And I don't know why. I, I just don't know. I, th I have hypotheses. I have guesses. But there's a strong driving interaction to put, to put it inside the pores. Even more so than carbon, and even more so than the like, kind of the optimal tri, uh, tri interaction sweet material. However, you still the one thing that comes across here we're kind of viewing as our top candidate moving forward is this polymer infused quaternary mean ozor because even under high ionic strength, you still get pretty decent absorption across the sweet, whereas even though Fluorinate ozorb is the by far the what if you said what was the biggest one? Well, here's the winner. This is the highest one we've ever seen, but it's only for this compound and it's only under high ionic strength. It still doesn't absorb PBFA hardly at all. So it's it's really talking about there could be some really interesting mechanisms that are happening here. And I'll I'll go into some more experiments that we did. That said, if 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 there was like a, an application of this, for instance, you had highly saline uh, RO retentate that had PFOS, this would be, this, these, these materials would be really wonderful at getting the capacity to absorb the, that, 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 that for PFOS. I think that if you want to push me, why is it going up? Is that the pore size is just right for Hemimicell, micell, bilayers, PFOS compounds, I think, really stick to each other. And what we're doing here is creating an architecture and a pore that's optimal, or at least better than these, to have absorbate absorbate interactions. So I, I'm moving forward, I think how to maximize the absorbate absorbate interactions to improve performance. We see signs of it here with this one experiment. Can we capitalize that in the future? Is something that we have to look for. We have to look for. So I, I wanted to, to dive deeper into this data. So I did show the isotherms for 
the absorption isotherms for the polymer modified quaternary amine material. So this is going to have a quaternary amine ionic interaction. And so here are all the diverse ones. So this is the long chain perfluorodecanoic acid. And here is the, the perfluorobutanoic acid. Not surprisingly, there's, these isotherms differ to a certain extent. So black is when with salt, and orange is when it's with the eye water. So when it's a short chain compound, adding salt really inhibits the binding. That suggests that the mechanism here is maybe presumably more ionic ionic interaction. However, when it's a long chain of perfluoroalkyl substances like perfluorodecanoic acid or perfluoroquinoic acid, adding salt has no real effect on the absorption of isotherm. So that's hinting that for long chain ones, there's a different type of interaction. It may be more on the, have to do with the perfluoroalkyl group. And that, that trend sort of go, follows along all the way across. And again, things that are neutral doesn't really matter. This is a neutral molecule. And here it actually flip-flops because, because of, this is a cationic perfluoro substance. So the mechanism may change for different compounds. And so if designing absorbent, one has to think about absorbent that can have different interactions to, to absorb the different type of PFOS compound. All right, this is a lot of data, but it's actually a pretty simple experiment. This is taking, this is a flow, a flow experiment, column experiment with the poly-QA ozorb, the polymer ozorb. What's going into the column is a, a mixture of all of those PFOS compounds. And collecting the effluent as a function of time, so applied bed volumes. And this is, and this is the concentration coming out. So if nothing's coming out, then it's zero, and if it completely is not, not being absorbed, then it's one. And this is the same list. So uh, these are all going in at the same time. So interestingly, the breakthrough is different. They don't all, like when they, when the, when they, um, when it reaches breakthrough, it's not like everything stops absorbing. So the first thing the breakthrough is the short chain one, then, then the C5 acid, the C6 acid, then we'll switch back to the C4 sulfonate, then we'll go to the C7 carboxylate, then we'll go to the C8 carboxylate, then we'll go to the C6 carboxylate, then the C8 sulfonate. The neutral one's great, and the long chain ones will, are still absorbing even after 25,000 bed volumes. So it's really interesting that these molecules are acting kind of independent of each other, and uh, but still being absorbing. By the way, this this call is still in progress, being run. It's accumulated 81 milligrams per gram of total PFOS at this point right here. So it's pretty pretty full, indicating that it's probably starting to swell. And another clue that it might be doing that is this really interesting behavior like this. It breaks through and says, no, nah, maybe not. <laughs> breaks, nah, I'll still absorb a little bit, right? You can see that, like all of them kind of hump down. We have other data I'm not showing. It does, it can kind of do this over and over and over again. And we think what this is, is that we're starting to crack open some more of these pores, opening them up to introduce a little bit more pore volume so that we now have a lot of other perfluoroalkyl substances in there that are, act, that are active sites to bring in the additional ones. In any case, we're getting a lot more capacity. And sometimes this, this downward part can be very profound before it goes back up again. I don't want to overwhelm you with lots of data. I just think this is really neat because it shows a lot of stuff on one graph. But, but we're, seeing, we're seeing the manifestation of the poor architecture expansion helping out with long-term absorption. A little bit about the mechanism. So does it, does it work to meet treatment goals? That's a good question. So what, to do that, the probably most appropriate thing to do is to treat actual groundwater. So this is a groundwater that we obtained from a site. Concentrations are, are high for the environment. They're in, the, they're in like the 40 parts per billion, uh, down to about one part per billion. These are actually pretty high. Um, 
you know, it's sometimes it's usually but but representative of, of, of groundwater. And so we did these at um, with with the fluorinated ozorb and our um, our polymer infused ozorb in this case at two different bed uh, flow rates. So um, again, we're seeing the same data that the larger the long chain PFOS compounds, PFOS, PFOA, are strongly absorbed. The shorter ones, not so much, only about 61% absorption there. For the polymer one, good absorption across the whole suite. This is, what, this is, this is something that is very encouraging to see. And if we slow the bed volume down to about 0.4 bed volumes per minute to give a little bit more contact time, we're, um, we're achieving uh, out effluent concentrations that are below the 70 parts per trillion EPA guidance level. So that's good. And we're continuing to run these columns to break through. And this is, so these are the break, this is the, the fast flow rate material with the polymer. So this is the total PFOS concentration starting to break through um, at about 10,000 applied bed volume. But it's dominated by the shorter chain one, the PFHPA coming through, PFOS, PFOA, pretty interesting. And, and one thing that's really interesting to me, which I still don't really quite understand from a chemist's point of view, but I'm sure there's a good answer, but if I thought about it more, I'll get help from other people. So PFOS and PFOA, they're, they're the same chain length, and they're the same, I, like they're the same in terms of the chemistry of the head group and that they're negatively charged. Yet invariably, PFOS is easier to remove from water. It, it, it absorbs better. And then I don't know why that is. It might have to do somehow with its affinity with itself. I'm not sure. But, but it always outcompetes PFOA. And we're seeing this again in this actual groundwater breakthrough curve. So what do we know so far? Um, the organosilica absorbents that we have are about three to five times better capacity than carbon, and about maybe twice that of an ion exchange resin, which is moving in the right direction. I didn't show this, but the PFOS compound, compounds can be desorbed with a methanol rinse. It doesn't require salt, uh, just methanol. So, so we're, well, that's what we're moving next into is to can regenerate it. So. Our big questions in the next few months are going to be, what does this absorption look like in the presence of other solutes? Now, we have the groundwater uh, system, but that doesn't have other organic solutes. So what does it look like in the presence of humic acid? What does it look, look like in the presence of BTEX? Those are compounds that also might be absorbed, and that could have an impact on our PFAS absorption capacity. That needs to be understood. Um, looking down the road, you know, what are the economics of this? Is this, you know, the, the, is this a potential remediation option? Right now, our thinking is mostly towards a, a physical chemistry perspective, understanding PFAS absorption uh, from these type of systems. But there could be implications to using these ideas and to treatment technologies. And, and generally, is there a role for high technology in water treatment like this? So I want to, to acknowledge this people that help me. My lab is completely undergraduate students. I don't have graduate students or postdocs. So these are the young men and women who help me. Um, however, they're really excellent. Uh, I think I want to particularly put a shout out for Kendall Ann Pike, who's right here, and Heather Hartman, who've done a lot of it. And Eva, Eva Stable, she's a senior. And she's completed 117 absorption isotherms since September. So she is a very hard worker. So I have excellent students that have done this. And the agency that helped fund this is CERTIP and NSF. So with that, I'll conclude and answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, before we start questions, I'll remind our online audience that you can type in your questions through the uh, GoToWebinar chat box. Uh, and so we'll open the floor for questions. So in the one slide uh, you showed with the saline water when you added uh, sodium chloride, uh, there was the one um, floral um, 
Ozorb that really did a yeah. good job yeah. on the one compound. Have you thought about mixing um, the different types of Ozorb together to, you know, take out most of that? And then the poly yeah. QA seems to work well for some yeah. of the others in having a mixture. Yeah, we, we, we have, I think we, I forget how many we've made. 30 different types, but I just didn't have time to go over them. I'm always already pressed for time already. And um, so we're trying to move in that direction. It's, it hasn't really answered the question, what's going on here? But, but we're, that's, that's something we got to, that's something we're doing. I think that if I, if I, rem, I don't have the data in front of me, so I can't really speak to it as well, but the adding a quaternary amine to the surface definitely helped get in this direction, right, to get the ma that maximum absorption. The only problem with the with that material is a little bit friable. So it may not be long-term a good, it's a really great understanding mechanism, but it's adding a, that quaternary amine to the silica gel really kind of makes it a little bit less sturdy. Uh, so I'm not sure if it would work really well long-term. So we kind of not been focusing on that data as much, but I should I should look at it more from a mechanistic point of view. Yeah. Um, um, I'm mean, a bit confused because the Ozorb is the uh, pretty much the hydrophobic, right? Mm -hmm. So and the, uh, the when you kind of flow kind of the PFAS contaminated water, so then Ozorb is uh, kind of the swallow in water system or just the uh, pathing through like Ozorb or something? So what, so well, how is it? Yeah, so hydrophobic. Like, uh, yeah, when you when you kind of yeah, react with, with the uh, uh, react the ozone with mm -hmm. the water. Yeah. So does the ozone the uh, kind of the swallow in water system or not? So to, so specifically to get it to absorb uh, like PFOS mm -hmm. or PFOA, you have to pre-swell the ozone with ethanol, and then rinse it with water, and then it has this open pore structure. Okay. For the for the poly QA ozorb, you don't have to do that for some reason. I think having all that polymer in there gets the pores open and allows the egress entrance of the of the PFOS substances. Okay. However, for for many most of the PFOS change, you need to pre-open the pores to get the absorption. Okay. For most, we've done both. <laughs> we've done unswollen and swollen. For short chain, actually, it works really well closed. So um, I saw a question come in from online. Uh, usually says, hi, great talk. I was wondering whether this material can be used as a passive sample, as a passive samplers to detect PFAS in the environment. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think it's a, I think that it, the one thing it might have to help with that is that it's, it's broad binding affinity for multiple PFOS compounds. If that's what the passive sampler needs to do, is to look at a wide range, then I think it would be well suited. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, the Ozorb you used is a really interesting material as an uh, absorbent, and uh, it seems that you can uh, use different uh, modification method to change its feature. Uh, I think uh, do you mean that you can change it from uh, hydrophobic material to hydrophilic material? Have you mentioned it? That, that's a that's a really good idea. Um, I I don't I don't remember. I'm sorry. But the P, the the QA the, when it's modified with a quaternary mean, it may be hydrophilic at that point, where we don't have to pre-treat it with ethanol to open up the pores to to facilitate the absorption. But I think we still do. So I, it's been very, very challenging to make a hydrophilic ozorb, even with the quaternary mean there. Yeah. Yeah. Applying some kind of the plasma to change the surface character. Radiation. I mean, from yeah, hydrophobic yeah. to hydrophobic. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. I, I, um, I've, I've tried. Yeah, just this takes us off. But permanganate, hydrogen peroxide, oxidation, it it does make it more hydrophilic. But it kind of 
destroys the swelling at the same time. So it, there's, there's enough deg degradation in the process and you kind of lose some of the functional aspects of the material. But yes, it does make it hydrophobic. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great thought. I remember you mentioned something about uh, you also use the, the ore swab uh, to target other materials rather than uh, pea foil compounds. Yeah. What are those materials? Have you tried the heavy metals? Heavy metals, uh, not, no. not Because the, the really ions don't really, unless maybe you swell it or something, they don't really bind. But the other things that we've, previous work, pesticides, uh, pharmaceutical compounds, BTEX, hydrocarbons, um, organic acids, like typical water solutes, organic water solutes, VOCs, PCE, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Good talk. Thank you. Um, my question is when you do solution, also do treatment, you're using sodium chloride to adjust, uh, you know, solving solution, the ion strength. Yeah. Usually we do using calcium chloride. Yeah. So I, I just wondering why using sodium, so, sodium chloride, did you try another, you know, salt to adjust the ion st stress? Yeah, I, that's a really good point. It's something I want to do next is like do calcium chloride. I did, you know, actually I use sodium chloride from a, it's not really like natural, like, but I did it because I thought calcium would be a, like since it's a bi divalent ion, might like connect together to to the surfactants and and improve the absorption. Where I was just trying to see just generally what does ionic screening do. But I think you're. But I think that's a really interesting experiment. Yeah, generally we do solving experiment, especially soil solving experiment. We're using typical the method of using uh, calcium chloride to adjust the ion. Yeah, I bet you it's going to improve the absorption actually. Yes, yeah. I think it will improve. <laughs> yeah. this, if you're using calcium chloride, uh, I can explain why, you know, the, the, the good move, the uh, P4, uh, uh -huh. P4S is better than P4A. Yeah, because it would like, yeah, it brings two together. Um, well, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one was, uh, what were your results with the different um, uh, pharmaceuticals with your um, Ozorb? And then while you answer that, I'll try to think of my other one. So to, to make it really simple, um, the absorption capacity is pretty much linear with octanol water partition coefficient plus one. So if you, if you look at the octanol water partition coefficient, add one to it, that's the partition coefficient to, to Ozorb. And then uh, my second question was, how low of concentrations did you test with the different uh, yeah. PFAS? Yeah, so we, we have columns that we're running two parts per billion. Mm -hmm. For the and using two ppm, right? For your for our, for our kinetics experiments, we, yeah. we're using two, two ppm. And that's mostly so we can just do a direct injection on the HPLC. It just gives us less. But then we're run, we run columns, I don't have this data where it's at 2 ppb, and then, but we have to concentrate the effluent with solid phase extraction prior to analysis, because the concentration is way too low then. Do we have one last question over here? Um, I'm also very curious about the uh, absorption capacity between the uh, PFOA and the PFOS. So yeah, I actually um I, I don't know is the uh, like um for example like the you uh, we might get some kind of hint by measuring kind of the surface the charge by measuring the uh, for example like the jet potential after uptaking that kind of the molecule. So yeah, perhaps yeah maybe, per yeah that's it. So that we might get some hints to uh, to solve that kind of issue. Yeah, I, you, that, that might be that might give some data. Right. I mean, they're same. They're 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 conceptually the same. That they're both anionic. Um, with uh, with the sulfonate, you know, that that like that negative charge can hybridize across four atoms. Where in, when in the carboxylate, it hybridizes across three. So I don't know if it has to do with the 
symmetry of that or some I don't know I, I don't know I mean that's I'm a chemist so I always think about like the orbitals and the structure so I usually go there I don't yeah yeah it's different there might be a different charge distribution on the surface I don't know I don't know this but I just see that I've routinely seen and you see it in the literature as well so it's not unprecedented that salt the sulfonates absorb better than the carboxylates to most media. Okay, we're coming up on our hour mark. Um, is it okay if people contact you later if they think of something? Sure. Okay. And so um, uh, I'll thank Paul again.